you can do. So, what's been happening? BBC News showed the shortest episode ever of Who Do You Think You Are? Um, I'm... Oh, I'm already dead. <laughs> BBC Breakfast, I think Bill and Naga took ketamine. That was the weekend. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was in the cellar. Yeah. <laughs> That's nothing. I'm pretty sure the guys at Look North dropped some acid. <laughs> Did anyone else see that guy with the scariest shadow ever? For me, in particular, <laughs> because I'm using references that are really <laughs> And finally, if you're going to put off a reporter, this is how you do it. The uh, ambulance just left, a fire truck just left, and there's a uh, firefighter uh, right now. Uh, but uh, everyone got sick. We're going to lie to that. So, what's been going on? Well, the big political news was UKIP's victory in the Rochester by election. UKIP has its second Westminster MP after it won the Rochester and Strood by-election. Mark Reckless took 16,867 votes. Mark Reckless, the second Tory defector turned UKIP MP, was big news. I'll go for a pint. <laughs> <laughs> who is this Mark Reckless? Who is this dangerous renegade, this maverick, who's tearing Westminster apart? Christ, he sounds so dynamic. I wonder how he celebrated. Nigel went on the pub last night. Um, to celebrate, how did you celebrate? Did you get any sleep at all? Uh, had a had an orange juice. <laughs> had, had an orange juice. <laughs> Later on, I had a Ribena. <laughs> reckless by name, reckless by nature. <laughs> shut up, shut up. <laughs> bloody shut your mouth! I bloody I bloody stayed up till eleven thirty. I did. <laughs> Bloody bonkers I am, I'm absolutely mad! <laughs> How did he get elected? He's the most nervous man I've ever seen. Oh, thanks for your help. It's okay. It's great to have you, uh, great to have you on board. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, <laughs> and we'll uh, get on with the day. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, it sounds like he's having a mini orgasm. <laughs> you can't have him as an MP. Imagine making speeches. We'll uh, <laughs> fight them uh, <laughs> on the beaches. <laughs> Has anybody got any Tropicana? <laughs> Mind you, it's easy to see why he defected to UKIP. I mean, the signs were always there. <laughs> No, if you're going to have right-wing policies, careful where you put the mic, Nigel. <laughs> now, did you see Farage after they won? He wins my award for most obvious statement of the week. If you vote UKIP, you get UKIP. <laughs> Obviously, you twat. <laughs> That's like saying, if you buy a banana, you get a banana. <laughs> now, what, what I find baffling, you get all these people going, we're voting for you, Kip, because we want to change. Eight weeks ago, Mark Reckless was a Tory MP. His government caused the problems that he's campaigning against. That's like me taking a shit on the floor, <laughs> then changing my clothes and going, who did that? <laughs> has shat on the floor. <laughs> what, he looked just like me? Unbelievable, that is. <laughs> Let's be honest, it's got nothing to do with change. We all know the reason why people vote UKIP. Politicians, well, most of them are, are, are liars. We are getting scam in this country. We're fed up with Tories and the Labour people. No control over immigration. Vote for a new party. Immigration is a concern. The others are faffing about. Because of immigration. I can't get a job. If I yeah. paint myself black or talk in a foreign language, I might get a job. <laughs> I'm not so sure you will. <laughs> Mind you, not everyone is affected by the fear-mongering talk of immigration. Did you see the wonderful answer that this kid gave? You're fine with having a mate from yeah. Poland, yeah. Bulgaria? There's no problem with that. No problem? Yeah. Uh, what do you say to a guy in Westminster in the House of Commons who says it is a problem? I say they need to buck up. <laughs> <laughs> I salute you, you little legend! The other thing I find fascinating about UKIP is that they've convinced the nation that they're the political party for everyday people. How? 
Have you seen the kind of people that fund them? Dimitri Marcosini, a now retired Greek businessman, was UKIP's sixth biggest individual cash donor last year. He's given UKIP a lot of money. So what's his major political gripe? Immigration? Tax? The NHS? No! Trousers! Do you think women should be banned from wearing trousers? Yes. What, by law? They used to be for, for thousands of years. Did you, do you know that, it, it, that until 300 years ago, a, a woman wearing trousers was, would be executed? <laughs> what a man of the people! <laughs> 300 years ago, a woman wearing trousers would be executed! <laughs> He's like a sexist version of the Churchill dog. <laughs> trousers, oh, no, no, no! <laughs> He's a lunatic! Look what he thinks will happen if women stop wearing skirts. There are several reasons not to wear trousers. The first is they don't look as nice as skirts. Uh, the second is trousers don't excite men. <laughs> Why should women dress to excite men? Because that's the only way the world is going to continue. If they don't, then pe men are going to stop <laughs> them. That's right. That's right, my friend. who funds UKIP thinks the greatest threat to mankind isn't disease, isn't climate change, it's trousers. <laughs> well, he's not going to like this. this week. <laughs> Did you hear about the economy? David Cameron's warned another global financial crisis could be looming. The Prime Minister says red lights are flashing because international issues like Ebola, instability in Ukraine and slowing markets could jeopardise the UK's recovery. According to Cameron, we're on the brink of another global recession. So what plan has he come up with to fix our ailing economy? <laughs> Children as young as five have been urged to start their own businesses as part of a raft of proposals from David Cameron. <laughs> Cameron wants toddlers running businesses. <laughs> his own daughter thought he was so stupid, she tried to break his neck. <laughs> teachers. Imagine trying to teach a five-year-old about business. OK, kids, what's your average turnover? Um, I don't know, about three times a night. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what are your overheads? Uh, clouds. <laughs> <laughs> OK, how do you reach out to your customers? Just like that, I just... <laughs> <laughs> Kids don't understand business, do they? You ask a child who Lord Sugar is, they think it's this guy. <laughs> I mean, what business can you run when you're five? I couldn't run a business. I couldn't even run properly. Go on, Rad. Mum's little angel. He's got his hands up like that. He looks like a bloody orangutan. Oh, oh, funny. Oh, yeah. Mind you, if this idea takes off, it's really going to change this programme. <laughs> Hello, dragons. I'm Russell Howard. What's wrong with his eyes? <laughs> Is he looking at me or you? Oh. You need to pack for your eye like a pirate. <laughs> so vicious. <laughs> You've heard of reggae reggae sauce. This is Rossi Rossi sauce. Yeah. freaking me out. Oh, I'm freaking you out. <laughs> Your little girl sat in a big chair. <laughs> she won't stop staring at me. If I was a real dragon, I would kill you with fire. Yeah? Well, if I was a... If I was a unicorn, I'd shit in your garden. <laughs> I'm out and chewing my teddy. I'm out. You make me sick. <laughs> Thank you. 
I know we're applauding the fact that I can't throw it. <laughs> Five-year-olds don't want to run businesses. They've got bigger issues, like love. You can't have three girlfriends. It's like I, I have to give one up. Oh, no. How are you going to decide who to give up? I don't know. It's like they're all pretty. I have to give one up. Oh, it's rough being five, isn't it? I wish I was four again. <laughs> it's the loveliest thing you've ever seen. I wish I was four again. <laughs> now I'm five, all I see is trouble. <laughs> now, unbelievably, toddlers running businesses wasn't even the maddest political story of the week. Did you hear what the Chancellor has been spending our tax money on? Chancellor George Osborne has a special civil servant who guards his fridge to stop people stealing his milk. <laughs> what a prick! <laughs> people are struggling to make ends meet and he's blowing his money on a fucking milk monitor. <laughs> ding a ling a ling Jeeves, make sure nobody takes my Cravendale. <laughs> Poor milk monitor. Imagine doing that for a living. I work for the government. What department? Semi-skimmed. <laughs> Don't worry, though. I popped into Downing Street this week. <laughs> so... What else has been going on? Well, bizarre news about funeral songs. Now, we're used to the weekly top 40 chart to find out who's been having the biggest impact on the music industry. Well, now that's been applied to the songs and hymns most frequently played at funerals. There was a study done to find the nation's top 30 favourite funeral songs, and they are absolutely mental. Did you see what was number one? Always look up. Cheeky, but understandable. <laughs> Did you see what was number four? <laughs> the match of the day theme tune! <laughs> How can you have that at a funeral? What, the vicar's gonna talk like commentators? Oh, that is an unbelievable cremation! <laughs> he's locked up, he's seen the space, and he's absolutely buried her. <laughs> The match of the day theme tune. The weirdest by far. Did you see what was at number 17? <laughs> People getting buried to Coronation Street. Imagine the mourners. I miss her every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. <laughs> Especially on omnibuses. <laughs> It's madness. You can't bury people to TV theme tunes. Imagine the vicar. And now we say goodbye for the final time. It makes you think, though, what music will you play at your funeral? I've already come up with mine. <laughs> now, elsewhere this week... <laughs> the BBC have been in hot water over subtitles. Now, the BBC has been criticised for using subtitles in an interview with a blacksmith in County Londonderry on its Country File programme. Did you see the interview? I can't believe they subtitled it. Here it is without the captions. It's so obvious what he's talking about. That's the ring against the jam. That was my father. The description of the handle. Yes. Kind that he's going to call in the centre of the floor. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> To be honest, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense with the subtitles on. Something about a unicorn. <laughs> you have to subtitle people sometimes. You need to hear what they have to say. Otherwise, you'd miss out on wonderful moments like this. Basically, there was a young lad and he looked awful similar to me. I thought I was fighting in the mirror, right? Come outside the nightclub, I was like, do I know you from somewhere? And he goes, do I know you? Do you know? 
And he had he had a Celtic jersey on, but he had he had the green and the yellow one, right? And I was I was about to throw a punch, and then he he, he looked at me in the eyes, and I go, do I? He goes, am I your father? I said to him, I must say, am I your son? And we just hugged it out. Turns out that no relation at all, and I just headbutted him. And I him away. You have to hear that. Isn't just the BBC in trouble. Did you hear about Paddington Bear? Paddington Bear's creator, Michael Bond, has spoken of his shock after the film version of his book was deemed unsuitable for young children. Well, the British Board of Film Classification had warned of sex references, dangerous behaviour and bad language. Paddington is too risque for kids. You're telling me? Now, you won't believe this, but I've managed to get hold of a sneak preview of the film. In a small little town lived a gentle little bear. Shit in the woods. Now, in 2013, a remarkably well preserved mammoth was found in permafrost, and this lady defrosted him. Tori gets a chance to examine the best preserved adult mammoth trunk ever found. What's really, really brilliant is that the most important end, the tip, is almost entirely complete. For Tori, the trunk is an emotional connection to this mammoth that lived so long ago. The mammoth's trunk is what it uses to interact with its environment, to pick up food for feeding, to um, caress its baby when it's suckling, to interact and reassure its friends and family. It looks like it's smiling at me. <laughs> Please welcome Dr Tori Herridge. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Now, I was going to shake your hand, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know where it's been. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. the in mammoth meat. Has it? Wow, you don't hear that often enough. <laughs> You've been up to your elbows in mammoth meat. That sounds like a really specialist pornography. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was it like dissecting a mammoth? What's that like? Absolutely incredible. I mean, right. I'm a paleontologist. I work on fossils normally. Yep. So to have the opportunity to actually sort of, you know, get up close and, you know, very, very, very interactive with kind of flesh, quite bloody in some respects. It was really sort of gory. Because that shirt was white before you started, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really... It was extraordinary. I can't... I mean, it was... It, they kept using the word emotional, and it was emotional, because, you know, it's, you're looking at something which has been dead for 40,000 years. And yet, somehow, it remained frozen, so it didn't fossilise. It looked and smelt like it had died maybe only a week or so earlier. Do you think the makeup girls who deal with Bruce Forsyth go through a similar kind of... <laughs> <laughs> what, one thing I didn't get, we've actually got a clip of it here, is you see a lot of experts, Siberian experts, and then, halfway through, you see this man doing this. Explain this to me. <laughs> And the flesh looked almost as fresh as the day that the mammoth had died. Now, what the hell is going on there? <laughs> had he forgotten his lunch? What's yeah. happening? What a legend! What do you what mean, what a le legend? legend? I mean, come on! I mean, it's like it's like the grand tradition of scientists experimenting on themselves. Imagine that you're in the field, you've yeah. got none of your lab equipment, yeah. you've just come across possibly the best preserved flesh of a mammoth ever seen and you're wondering how fresh is it really how fresh what will you do how else can you test it i thought you'd be annoyed because like wow a mammoth and he's like oh yeah i'm not no, no. <laughs> like the louis suarez i'm <laughs> 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 well, sure that would annoy you yeah it's just, it just a wee nibble wasn't it it wasn't like he ate the whole thing did you have a bit no i mean by the time i got to it it'd been defrosted then refrozen <laughs> people are making kebabs and... out of yeah, it so, yeah. <laughs> okay. i do wonder though whether i would have I never asked him what he tasted like, and I really regret that. 
I was like, I'm intrigued. Out. Yeah, I really want to know. So, uh, can... Because, basically, you've brought an animal. Um, the, 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 the mammoth defrosted, and there was blood in the mammoth. Mm -hmm. So to, that raises the idea that we could bring the mammoth mm -hmm. back to life. Yeah. So could we bring animals back to life? People are trying. I right. mean, they're trying. So one of the main groups that were there were a group from South Korea, from a place called Suam. Yes. And they were taking samples of the tissue, the flesh, and some of the blood as well. Um, and they're hoping that in there somewhere, because it was so well preserved, that they're going to find a complete mammoth cell with all of its DNA perfectly intact. And if they find that, what they want to do is like, snip out that bit of the cell with all the DNA, pop it into an Asian elephant and egg cell, yeah. zap it with electricity and make it grow into a mammoth baby. What if he ate the bit? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> if that was the bit thereafter, <laughs> and a mammoth grows out from within it. <laughs> Are there any animals specifically you'd like to see back? Well, I don't want them to bring the mammoth back. You don't like, want to bring him back. No, he's even gone. Though, yeah, it's all right, well, get rid of it. Yeah, even though it'd be wonderful to see it, you just can't do it, as far as I can see, without involving some Asian elephants along the way what to experiment about? on them. I've got some ideas here for animals mm. that we could crossbreed. <laughs> <laughs> we cross we crossbreed a cat and a dog. Yeah. Which is a pet that's always pleased to Cock. see you, but buries its own shit. <laughs> Not, bad. Not bad. Is that allowed? Would you have that? I think it's more interesting than just bringing back a mammoth, actually. I mean, I have to say, that's good, because people often talk about bringing things back, and you're never going to actually get something back from the dead. You're always going to be creating something new, so why not get imaginative? Well, if we're getting imaginative, <laughs> how about we crossbreed Boris Johnson with a meerkat? <laughs> it would be not... Imagine having a little Boris meerkat in your room, just tickle its belly, and just nonsense pours out. <laughs> would you clone yourself? Oh, no. Why? I don't think... No, would you? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, I was talking about this with my mates. Right, as you're a scientist, you might know the answer mm. to this, right? But if I was with my clone, let's say, right? Mm. Your younger I... clone, so as you were getting older and older and older, it would be a constant reminder of your lost youth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you're with your clone. Yeah, well, the... <laughs> what I'm about to ask you <laughs> is now really different because. <laughs> That me and the clone were the same age. Yeah, interesting. But we're not. No. Right, well, let's, let's make him a bit older for this. <laughs> so let's say I'm about, you know, I'm about 60, mm -hmm. and me and my clone are in, in uh, our bedroom in separate beds. <laughs> if I, as you're a scientist, if I catch him masturbating, uh. does that make me gay if I watch? <laughs> No, probably not. How, would you, do you feel gay, Russell? <laughs> I mean, would you like to talk about that a bit yeah, more? Yeah, possibly. <laughs> Why not? We could borrow here. I just think it'd be weird, wouldn't it? Mm. But, like, but well, I, don't, bit, I mean, I suppose... I'd be like, oh, least, good yeah. on you, that's not how I do it, but, you know, whatever you want to... Give some tips. I'd give him yeah. some tips, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've already given him one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I read a very interesting thing about you. One of the things that got you into uh, <laughs> science, you know what it is, mm -hmm. was reading <laughs> the Clan of the Cave Bear mm. books. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Clan of the Cave Bear books, but I've got a quote here from Mammoth Hunter. Oh, God, yeah. So this is going to be good. She felt under his parka and tunic for his drawstring, untied it, then reached for his hard, throbbing member <laughs> and rubbed her hands along its shaft. Well, that just screams science, doesn't mm. it? <laughs> yes. It never... It's easy why you thought, I'm going to find me a mammoth. Do you know, and the, do you know what the worst thing is, Russell? Because I, you know, these are, yeah, I came across these books when I was a you teenager. You what? Across these books? <laughs> the word. Brilliant. Brilliant. Finally, they pulled apart. Mm -hmm. I should clean myself a little, she said, getting up. <laughs> these are new leggings. <laughs> he said... This is the romantic bit. Yeah, the romantic bit, yeah. When we get back, you can leave them outside to freeze yeah. and then brush it off. Yeah. <laughs> Great book, you should read them all. <laughs> what's, what's next for you? Uh, well, we've got some more field work in Sicily and Malta. Oh, so, nice. yeah, next year. So, we're going back to Malta to work in this cave, which actually, if you go on holiday to Malta, you can go there. Everyone can visit it. It's called Hardalarm Cave. And there it's full of um, dwarf hippo, dwarf elephant, and dwarf deer skeletons. All oh, right. And we're trying to work out how old they are by taking bits of stalagmite and dating them. When are you doing that? Uh, hopefully, March, if we get the permits. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Dr. Corey Henry!
what a think tank in Sweden is campaigning for. Swedish sex education group campaigning to have a word for female masturbation officially recognised and invite people to make suggestions <laughs> for what it should be. <laughs> They've invited people to come up with a name for female masturbation. These guys are already on it. Play the trumpet. Bombs in the garden. The widening of the A453. Prawn linguine. <laughs> Line dancing. Piston stuffing. Coma in a bottle. Dickering around. The handling of bushmeat. Banana split. <laughs> Climbing the stairs. Fiddling with the controls. Holding a kitten. The fish twitcher. Drilling for oil. Cutting concrete. Rat running. Thigh slapping. Dribble, dribble, dribble. Ribbon cutting. Get a wiggle on. Do you know what a wormhole is? Absolute animal. Finally tonight, a story about a wonderful dog who was just too courageous to ignore. We're doing our acclimatization for the World Cup and uh, getting ready for the start. High in the mountains of Ecuador, team peak and performance were preparing for a gruelling adventure. Yeah. What none of them knew is that they'd pick up another teammate along the way. They met him somewhere in the Amazon, ragged and hungry. They gave him a meatball and shooed him away. But the dog had other ideas. As they continued their 440-mile race, he never left their side. He defined the word dogged. Struck by his fearlessness, they named him after King Arthur. On the kayak stage, he swam alongside his new teammates until they lifted him onto the boat. Where they slept, he slept. And when they finally reached the finish line two days later, Arthur was with them. He was a street dog, and I think um, to just follow us on this adventure, it was like, I think he was thinking that, OK, this is my chance. These guys have been kind to me, and that means something. I, I go with these guys. Next stop, the vet, for probably the first time in his life, and for the team, the realisation that they couldn't leave him behind. By now, his fame had spread and he arrived in Sweden to a hero's welcome. The South American stray who'd won his teammates' hearts and travelled 6,000 miles to find a home. Yeah, oh, that was lovely. What well, a Thank you very much for watching the news. And ladies, for God's sake, wear trousers. In fact, <laughs> better still, get a load of your mates together and do this. Oh.